Welcome to the Medical Mnemonist Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, take a journey into the top techniques for medical mnemonics, study skills, board exam tips, and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Today, we're joined by Saud Siddiqui, one of the co-founders and CEO of Sketchy. They've raised over $30 million in investment funds for their products. I know you're all probably aware of them already. We had Brian and Aaron on in episode 17. Now we get to hear from the third co-founder. Saud, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Chase. I'm excited to be on with you. I'm glad you're joining us too, because we got to hear a little bit from the Lemieux brothers before, and it's been a long time. So I think we do need to refresh the audience's memory on Sketchy and what you guys do, what you're about, and kind of how you got into it. So would you mind telling the audience just a little bit about your history and how you guys started this? So Sketchy was founded back in 2013. We were all med students at the time. We were you know, going through what med students go through, trying to learn volumes of information, complex information quickly, and trying to retain it for all the exams that they kind of take month after month and for our boards. So it was myself, Andrew Berg, Brian, Aaron. And so the three of us were at UC Irvine, Andrew, Brian, and myself, and Aaron, who is Brian's twin brother, was done at UC San Diego. And so as we would try traditional study methods, taking notes, kind of all the traditional ways, you know, reading through a book, it just wouldn't work. And we just felt like we kept falling further and further behind. So we just started using things like humor to kind of get through the study session, using things like art, drawing on a whiteboard, drawing on pieces of paper and creating these characters. And it worked surprisingly well. We would take the test the next day. And the only thing we would remember would be the things that we learned in our drawings and stories and we continue to do this. We taught our friends how to do it. And at some point, just wanted to share it with people in the world. And so what we did is we created a couple YouTube videos just to see what people would say. And the response was quite... One, it was you know immediate. People found it somehow. People would share it and people were asking us when the rest would come out. And this is the Salmonella video that is still on YouTube. Uh, that was the first one we ever made. The story is a bit longer and I could spare you the story now, but you know, we decided as students to take the leap and create the rest of the content. And here we are today. And it's definitely been a great success. Everyone talks about it. Everyone knows your product. And I'm really curious because you said you were teaching your friends, your classmates, how to do this. And for the audience, it's something that we try to cover a lot is how can they create their own visual mnemonics? And I'm Wondering if you have any thoughts on that, or how were you teaching your friends and colleagues about these types of techniques? Yeah, so part of it was just walking them through what we had created. So almost a teaching experience for the material itself. So like a certain microbe, for example. And the reason I bring that up is when we created the sketchy videos, we wanted to recreate that experience where it was like sitting with us and we're drawing this out before you making it drawn out, going layer by layer, going symbol by symbol. That was all to kind of recreate that experience of being there with us. And, you know, we didn't want to have just like a picture and then walk you through it. We really wanted it to be sketched in and drawn in to recreate that. So that was a lot of the teaching, but in terms of, you know, how to do it and how we did it, we would really try to hit the most important points that we need to memorize. We would try to keep scenes cohesive. We would try to use objects that wouldn't it be hard to remember that, that they were in a scene? The memory palace technique, oftentimes people will use a familiar space. So like a room in their house, for example, because you don't need to remember what a room in your house looks like because it just, you know, you know that. So when we do things like, you know, in the desert or in space or whatever, like we're going to have pyramids, we're going to have a sphinx, we're going to have things that should be there and then attach the information to that because that gets you kind of closer to kind of that pure method of of a familiar space. Gotcha. I love the aspect of visual mnemonics. They're so powerful for our memory, like reading a textbook. I can't remember any of that. Rote memorization doesn't work. Obviously, space repetition can work very well if done properly, but it's also very time consuming to set up properly and to do all the repetitions and just a plan for it sometimes. A colleague of mine, Greg Rodden, who actually 
co-authored the book we wrote, Read This Before Medical School. Sometimes I'll be talking to him and he'll be like, wait a minute, let me recall my sketchy image for that. So he still uses that to this day, even in his residency to recall certain facts here and there. So it's very, very useful. And I love the creativity that you guys use. And it's got to be maybe a little more tricky for you trying to make something that everyone can understand, right? It can't be too personal because then the rest of the audience isn't going to understand it. So how do you guys decide sort of what themes to use and how to go from there? You know, in the beginning, it was just the name of a microbe would lend itself to something like, you know, Pseudomonas, Mona Lisa. It's just a lot of those are really easy, especially for micro. We have the coronavirus with the crown. And there's a new one coming out, by the way, soon. Macrolides with crows. It's like a lot of this stuff was like, oh, yeah, like it sounds like that. And that's kind of the first thing you'd think of. Strep A Galactia was actually the first one that we drew on a piece of paper. It was a really bad, like, stick figure thing that <laughs> we would never have put it online. You know, like A Galactia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like A Galactia was like a galactic baby. That's literally how we did it in the beginning. Now we have sort of a different approach where it's because again, this method was something that we just like kind of stumbled upon and we just like started doing. We're not like we were med students, you know, we were just like trying to get through this through school and figure this out. But now if we're doing a certain unit or a certain chapter, we try to keep it all in that same theme and kind of plan beforehand as like what's going to be there. And so Aaron on our team spends a lot of time on that. So he's now like officially like chief creative officer and that's kind of his, his world. And he's kind of that sketchy historian. I mean, another person on our team, Ben Muller, who worked closely with him, also medical background, also an artist as well. So they help come up with these things. And some of it is, there is some like pop culture references in there, just one for fun, but also because people know that stuff and it helps them remember, but most of the things that we include are understood or referenceable kind of by the general population. It's not like we're going super into detail about like, you know, a specific theme or whatever. It's very generalizable. Yeah, I noticed a lot of pop culture references. And actually, for me, it's difficult because a lot of them I understand from TV stuff. But if it's like music or anything like that, it's a pop culture that I don't follow that well. All right. So we have these visual mnemonics that you guys create. And I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on different types of study techniques. Like what are some of the most effective ways that students can implement these now? What are the best things they should do with their time to get the most out of their study time to be as efficient as possible? Is it going to be a lot of space repetition? Is it going to be a lot of visual mnemonics? Is there pros and cons to each kind of what are your thoughts on all of that? It's really a combination of those things. And so you really have this multifaceted approach, I'd say. I think with Sketchy, we are a learning tool. So even if you've never seen the material before, you can learn it for the first time with us. And we do, you know, for like an important process or like a mechanism that you need to learn, we do go through that as well. So like, for example, in the, the meningitis video, kind of, you know, how shock occurs or the digoxin video, kind of how the... A ATPase is being blocked. So we do include a lot of that. But I think what we do really well is we create that kind of folder in your brain where it's like, I need, that's where I kind of keep this information about digoxin or whatever it may be. And then as you learn more, you can kind of continue to think of that space. And so you're able to go back there and retrieve that information. Now, there's a difference between learning something understanding it, and then being able to recall it. And I think there's going to be really two, two things that are going to help people recall. One is, you know, in what context did you learn it? Did you just like read the lines of text or did you, you know, do something like a sketch where it was like a scene and you can actually visually picture it and go back in that space? We really believe that the visual learning side of it is far more effective than just reading text. And I think that a trap that a lot of people fall into is rereading text and rereading text to, you know, like notes, like some people reread their notes over and over and over. And I'd say that's really an illusion of mastery where you feel more familiar and familiar with their notes, but you're not really prompting any recall. 
or making your brain do any hard work to extract that information. And that's the other component of it where I think things like questions come in, where things like space repetition come in, things like flashcards. And these are things that we are working on adding more and more into our platform. But space repetition works. People have used it for years. It works. And I think combining that with something visual like sketchy is, and then with questions as well, to really interrupt your forgetting of of what you've learned is going to be really the, one of the best approaches I'd say. I definitely agree. We've covered this in so many episodes in the past, but it's still important to reference that, yes, rereading your notes, rereading the chapters, all of those things are not useful. They have been proven time and time again, not to increase your memory because you're just reading it. You're not recalling the information. So that's the beauty of something like space repetition, like flashcards. You have to recall the information without a primer, without looking at it, and that will strengthen your memory on the topic. So, and adding the the visual images is just it's natural. Picture's worth a thousand words. Well, yeah, it can be worth a thousand medical terms too. So as long as you remember the image correctly, which is much easier to do than trying to memorize every word for word on a page, it's going to increase your general success as a student in your study skills. Yeah. And the thing about the notes is like, I used to do that too. It feels like it's working, but it isn't. So it's just something that I think is just really common. I mean, I used to do it and it's just like, okay, well, I don't remember any of that stuff that I reread. So I think it's, it's interesting. And it's something that I think more and more people are like catching on to. That's why I started the podcast because I made every mistake out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, me too. Like I made a ton of these mistakes. One other thing I would add to that is once you have the knowledge, using it to do something creative or just Using it to to do something also, I think, strengthens your knowledge of it and your memory of it. Um, And that could be as simple as like teaching it to someone or like making your own sketch or whatever it is, actually pulling it out of your brain and turning it into something else. And the better you know something, the more creative you can get with that. But that's also a good way to strengthen your memory knowledge on a certain topic. I'm thinking like drawing out a mind map, drawing out a sketch, yeah, teaching someone. If you don't have someone to teach, tell your dog, tell your plant, talk to the wall. Either way, you're recalling the information and you're finding out where your gaps in knowledge are so you know what to study more later on. Exactly. You got to make your brain work a little bit. Yeah, studying's not easy. If you're comfortable with your studying, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> I am kind of curious. Last time I spoke to Sketchy Team, there was discussions about more integrated topics, more step two topics coming out. And it's easy to see how the material that I used in medical school too, your first couple of series of videos is good for step one. There's a lot of information that needs to be memorized. But then when you're moving to step two, you have a lot of diagnostic algorithms and these other ways of thinking. How are you guys approaching that? Yeah. So we've put out step two materials. And I think as we've created more and more, We've learned how to do it better. There's just a lot more information that you need to know clinically. And I think the tough part is that part of it is you're going to get it from the patient and part of it is you're going to have to pull it out of your brain. And so some of the things that we've been thinking about are, you know, what parts of this lesson or, you know, disease process or whatever it may be is going to be things that you just need to know and understand and have like gone through once and what parts of it are are really things that are going to like tip off a diagnosis or that you're really going to have to pull out of your head at the bedside or you know things that you're just going to have to remember kind of on the fly and so that's one way that we've approached it and trying to like emphasize the latter kind of in the sketchy way and so the other thing we've done is we've walked through basically like a soap format So like what's subjective, what's the objective, what's the assessment and what's the plan. And so we've been continuing to kind of improve upon that. I'd say in the beginning, there'd be a lot in the video and we're like, hey, let's, you know, cut this down a bit. And so we're getting to a point where it's kind of that sweet spot, but it's definitely different than a bug, you know, where it's like, okay, you just need to know it's gram negative and that it's catalyst positive. Like that's easy, you know, but learning the algorithm for what you need to do in a clinical situation is definitely a bit more complex and requires a little bit more work. Yeah, it's very complex. I've definitely struggled with that in creating my own mnemonics. It was 
much easier to create just the sort of like all the micro information what's going to be the antibiotic for it where are you going to see it on the body what types of diseases are associated with it but when you go down the algorithm and the algorithms are constantly changing you know guidelines are always changing in medicine it's very difficult to add that into a mnemonic i suppose i'm guessing that would probably be something better for like a story method than a memory palace type thing so here's stage one here's stage two here's stage three but i still have yet to figure out like a very concise way of doing it for everything it's very indiv- individualistic depending on the topic yeah i think it is and i think it's something that we're actually thinking through right now is there a way to kind of break up the topic you may just learn something just straight learn it you know like we just like kind of walk you through it and then there's always going to be those certain things that are just tough to remember or that you just need to somehow differentiate. So I'll just give you an example, like the different types of like AKI, right? It's like pre-renal, intrinsic, post-renal. It's like, what is my workup to figure out what's going on here? And that just that part alone could be a sketch because that may be like the one part that you will need to remember. But like, you'll, you'll know that like, pre-renal is before the kidney and it's like you know hypovolemia and you just kind of think of those things so we're thinking about does it make sense to create kind of these shorter pearls almost of you know this is what i need to memorize the rest of it i'll kind of pick up or i can kind of watch that longer video and just like kind of go through the whole thing but what's that like thing that i need to remember so like you know i have emergency medicine background so i think of things like tox is like great for this where it's like I need to remember this toxidrome, you know, were they sweating? Were they not sweating? What's the acid base, you know, for this particular overdose, things like that, I think can work really well. So for us, what we're doing is really identifying those things and then really targeting those with our sketches. Well, I kind of want to switch gears here a little bit because something that I'm noticing a lot with at least the network that I work with a lot is we have a lot of medical students and professionals going into content creation, whether that be creating videos like you guys do, creating podcasts like this. It's interesting to hear a little bit about being a medical education entrepreneur, for lack of a better term, because I think a lot of students currently in medicine or in medical school might be thinking of doing something like that, whether that be joining your team or my team or anyone that's out there, or they just want to create something on their own. What is it like, in your opinion, to be sort of an entrepreneur in this medical education sphere? It's really an interesting experience because I think when we started this, we never thought that it would you know, be what it is today. We thought it would just be like a couple of videos out there. Some people use it and it's just like you kind of go on. But I think, you know, what happened is that we stumbled upon this idea, tried really hard to make it good and then just like put it out there and it really picked up. A lot of things like this and like a lot of, I think, entrepreneurial ideas is that they start to kind of take a life of their own and you just kind of keep going and keep pushing and keep creating more. And that's kind of what happened to us. And I mean, we, so we were students and, you know, we'd like come back after our rotation, 12 hours in the hospital and then freaking create these videos, you know, and like do these stories and like you get downtime and then. I may be on like uh, a rotation relevant to some content we're doing and we just like start writing these scripts. It's not easy because you're doing two things and medical training is like hard enough in itself. So you've really got to believe in it because it's, you have to push yourself to do it. You're going to spend your weekend working on this stuff. If something happens, especially in the beginning, there was, you know, just the four of us. If, customer needs something like it's you the buck always stops with you something happens on the site like you got to fix it something's up with the content like you got to fix it we slowly started to build our team because you know you start to realize like hey the four of us can do everything we need we need help it was really a long process i mean we had a couple years of it in med school we all took like one rotation off to like just focus on it for you know i had like six weeks of just straight sketchy like in the middle of med school and that like ate away at my like time off, you know, but that was fine because it just like I wanted to do it and just shift around some rotations. 
you know, there were people who were like, why are you doing this? This is crazy. You know, you're wasting your time. And so you're always going to hear these things. It's going to be a lot of work. It's like going to be, you're going to be kind of in the trenches and you're not going to be sure always if what you're doing is going to be something. But I think truly believing your idea, having that conviction and kind of that vision is crucial for you to kind of get through all that. And I ended up going to residency. I was, you know, helping out kind of remotely as much as I could. But as you know, residency is also super busy. But I think it definitely gave me a perspective on like, you know, what can we do kind of teaching clinically and sketchy as well. But when I got back, it was like last year, I had to pick one. I mean, I was doing both. I was like in the hospital and I was being sketchy. I was in the hospital, I was being sketchy. I was like, you know, I got to figure out what I'm doing. And, and I decided, hey, now's the time I'm just going to take the leap and go full time on sketchy and continue to build this company. And so I think at some point you hear a lot of stories where people just like take that leap the first day. And like, if you could do that, great. But like some people can't do that and that's okay too. I wasn't able to, I just like kind of kept going. And when I was ready, I did. And that's just, you have to be able to do both if you're not ready to make the leap. And when you are ready, you'll know and you'll do it. And I'm glad I did. It's a good experience, but it is definitely a hard one. Yeah. And you definitely probably want to to weigh the pros and cons there. If you're just starting something off, it's not really that well known. Might want to have that backup plan. But once it takes off, you feel a little safer about making that switch, then it's got to be very enlightening to know that you have that option, that you're going to be very successful no matter which way you go. So I uh, definitely congratulate you and the rest of the team on how successful it's been. I think it's going to be a great resource for many years to come. I'm wondering if there are any other last minute tips or resources that you might recommend for students trying to get through school right now? For kind of the first few years of med school, especially as you're kind of going through that preclinical grind of, you know, exam after exam after exam. One thing that really helped me was trying different study methods and being open to different study methods. So I tried everything. And I think there's enough volume that you can, you know, try a bit of everything and really figuring out what works for you. I think giving different study methods a chance is really important and experimenting to figure out what works for you. And I think once you get to kind of your clinical rotations, Studying beforehand is really important. I think some people go into rotations, just kind of, I have no idea what I'm doing and I'm just going to learn while I'm here. And some people go into it. No, me too. Yeah, that was me too. And some people go into it just like fully prepared and like they destroy it. And I think that like, it's, there's so much to learn and it's so different from your preclinical years that just taking that little bit of time beforehand to just prepare yourself. I think we'll go a long way. And I think that folks will kind of enjoy their rotations a bit more because it's hard. You just like show up and you like, I don't know, I have no idea what you're doing. And, you know, I went through that and I felt like once I started, you know, just putting in that little extra time beforehand. And it was when I started doing my like emergency medicine rotations is like a fourth year. Cause you know, that's what I was going to do. So I was like, oh, I got to be really good on this. You just enjoy it more because you're like, you studied something, you got ready, you see it and you're like, oh yeah, now I'm going to go like apply what I learned. And that really helps cement your knowledge rather than kind of going in blind. So I think using those opportunities with patients to reinforce what you learned prior is really important. Yeah, that was definitely me not the most prepared going into clinical rotations. Also, I started, shameless plug, my other podcast, the One Minute Preceptor podcast. So if anyone wants tips for going into clinical rotations, what to expect, how to get letters of recommendation, that is the show for you. Well, I think this has been a great interview. We've learned so much from you about the just the company and about how to study and everything else. Uh, what are some ways that the audience can find out more about your product and reach you? Yeah, so we are, as a company, we always want to be close to the student. And so we've really made an effort to open kind of those lines of communication. And so, you know, when people reach out to us, you know, by email, on our social media, we listen. We've got things like feedback on our site now, and we're really trying to orient ourselves and get closer and closer to the student um, so we can do what we do best. So really, you know, email or social media, I think you'll see a lot of people on there is a good way to kind of keep up with us and what we're doing. 
you know, podcasts like this are awesome because I can just, you know, conversationally tell you what we're up to. And then, yeah, I mean, I'm on like Twitter. You can like find me there. I think you'll see us more and more kind of out there with the student. We do things like focus groups even and like, hey, come and try this new thing and tell us what you think. And, you know, if it's great, tell us. If you hate it, tell us. So we're, we're really open and we just want to, you know, make the best product we can. Well, Sayud Siddiqui from Sketchy, thank you so much for sharing your insights and coming on the show today. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Chase. Have you been thinking about one-on-one training and tutoring at a reasonable price? Well, Prospective Doctor is now sponsoring a limited number of free sessions with me each month. To register, you can go to prospectivedoctor.com slash chase and register for a free 30-minute coaching session. If you decide that you want to use their MCAT or USMLE tutoring services, you can now use the code CHASE10 to receive 10% off of your first $400 spent. Just enter CHASE10 and get your discount now. The Medical Mnemonist Podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including USMLE tutoring and residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.